So we are coming up on um, Women's History Month, aren't we? Starts on Friday. Uh, so what better time to talk about um, women's history? And the, the, this presentation today is really a kind of a broad brush of sort of how did we get from long skirts and you know kind of staying in the background as women um, to you know getting right out there in the front short skirts and getting the vote how did how did that happen and what were the major milestones along the way so that's what we're going to talk about today I just want you to notice you know I'm, I'm votes for women I, you know I, <laughs> You know, it's, it's hard to get these pins nowadays, but I, I managed to get one uh, because I believe in votes for women. So in 1920s, um, it, it represented an exciting new time for women with new freedoms, new opportunities uh, that had been greatly expanded from anything that women had enjoyed before. Certainly something that their grandmothers and possibly even their mothers could never have imagined. In the 1920s, conservative opinion declared loudly that women had changed, had become something completely different from what they had been before. Women were at the vortex of a fiery revolution, part of the new flaming youth. They bobbed their hair they shortened their skirts, they stuck flasks in their garters, um, and they danced until all hours of the morning. Shocking. In general, they thumbed their noses at the dull, conventional worlds of their mothers and grandmothers. These are easy generalizations passed down to us. Everybody knows about the you know, flappers of the 1920s, but like all such sweeping characterizations, they're only part of the story. Women uh, did not, it, it's an over, oversimplified view, women did not suddenly change in the 1920s. Um, uh, they did not start to make themselves over because of the rumble seat and the purported uses of the rumble seat. Um, nor was it even because of um, winning the right to vote. In fact, women had been changing for decades slowly at first, and the roles of women slowly at first, and then as time progressed, began to speed up and speed up, and certainly the last couple of decades leading up to the 1920s was a much more rapid change, but it had been coming on for a long time. So today we're gonna journey through those decades and see some of the milestones and see sort of the evolution of how we got from Abigail Adams to the fiery youth of the 1920s. In 1776, Abigail Adams is known to have written to her husband John, who was uh, with the Continental Congress, uh, tasked with writing the, the Constitution and the new code of laws. And she wrote to him and she said, in the new code of laws, which I assume it will be necessary for you to uh, write down to govern our new country, I would encourage you to remember the ladies and be more generous and favorable than, to them than your ancestors. Do not put such unlimited power in the hands of the husbands. Remember, all men would be tyrants if they could. <laughs> John wrote back, as to your extraordinary code of laws, I cannot but laugh. But he did go on to admit, depend upon it, we know better than to repeal our masculine systems. Because he admitted, at least to Abigail, that in fact women already had a lot of power. It just wasn't codified. Rights for women were exceedingly limited. Up until the 1848 uh, Married Woman's Property Act. Up until that point, a woman did not control even her own assets, even if they had been assets prior to her marriage. The moment that she married, control of herself and her person, any children that she had by a previous marriage, um, all assets, everything passed to her husband to do with as he saw fit. Some states before 1848 made some small 
changes to that. Um, but by and large, that was the, the, the world in which women lived in. Of course, there are always exceptions. As a single woman of property in Maryland, pictured on the left an illustration, Margaret Brent uh, frequently appeared in the courts to argue both her own cases, um, because she did have property and she had no, um, uh, no husband at that time. Uh, she also um, represented her brother. Her brother Giles asked her to represent um, him in the courts as well. She was a controversial but powerful figure because she did have capital. She had wealth. In 1756, Lydia, Lydia Taff, in our very own state of Uxbridge, she was given the first woman to be given the right to vote because her husband had passed, as well as her son, and there was no male to represent the family. And so the town of Uxbridge voted to allow her to vote. Deborah Sampson of Plymouth, Massachusetts, on the right, took a different approach to being a woman in a man's world. And during the Revolution, she disguised herself as a man and presented herself for military duty under the name of Robert Shirtliff. She served for three years undetected. She was wounded twice, um, a head wound uh, once and then uh, a sword uh, wound. And both times she managed to avoid detection. It wasn't until she contracted a brain fever that the attending doctor discovered her secret. But instead of saying anything, he actually just took her to his own quarters and nursed her where she would have private care and better care. Uh, and it's said that she did get a soldier's pension uh, by authorization of George Washington at the conclusion of the uh, revolution. Education for women took place in their homes on a very or on a very limited basis in schools. And I say on a very limited basis because, for example, Susan B. Anthony um, was denied certain subjects in the school she attended because of her gender. A woman was educated, if she, if she received any education at all, she was educated with an eye to her future role in educating her children on the very basic sort of education level. She would provide them with the basics and then um, depending upon their social and economic status, the sons might go on to further schooling after that. It would later be written that the history of mankind is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations on the part of man toward woman, having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over her. Limited education had historically been a large part of this tyranny. If you weren't educated, you couldn't get ahead, you couldn't get a job, you couldn't work, you couldn't fend for yourself. However, in 1821, the Troy Female Seminary, the first endowed school for women, was founded in New York by Emma Willard. Emma Willard had, was already an established teacher and educational administrator uh, when she wrote a pamphlet called A Plan for Improving Female Education, which outlined the benefits to all of society in educating women. She petitioned the state of New York for funds to establish such a school, but was denied. But the city of Troy raised the funds and agreed to open the school if Emma would come to run that school, which she did. She, her education, the education system that she put forth offered traditionally male subjects, zoology and botany and sociology and um, chemistry, natural philosophy and such. Emma knew, though, that many of her students would go on to establish homes, so she also included home management and home economics and such uh, cl classes like that. If she couldn't find a suitable book, she wrote textbooks herself. And as a matter of fact, I happen to come across in my library because I have a lot of um, things that have been passed down to me. My house, as my children will say, looks like a museum. Um, and this is one of the museum pieces. <laughs> Um, this is the abridged history of the United States within the Republic of America by Emma Willard, 1845. Wow. So this is one of the books that she would have created 
uh, as a textbook. The Troy Female Seminary was very successful. Um, and it also established the fact that women could indeed learn the exact same things that men could learn. Contrary to what some people believed, many noted authorities, such as all the way to 1873, Dr. Edward Clark wrote in a uh, widely respected sex and education publication, a girl can study and learn, but cannot do all this and retain uninjured health and a future secure from neuralgia, <laughs> uterine disease, hysteria, and other derangements. Ladies, <laughs> do you suffer from any of these? In 1833, Oberlin College became the first coeducational co college in the United States. And as we all know, knowledge is power, and women were making the first steps on a powerful journey that would take them nearly a century. At about the same time, in publishing the book Course of Popular Lectures, Fanny Wright became one of the first women to actually write about the idea of suffrage. I mean, earlier on, women wanted to have certain rights, wanted education and such, but we're not talking at that time about actually getting any kind of voting uh, uh, um, privileges. Fanny was from Scotland. Uh, and she moved to the United States to form a colony, a socialist colony, on land that she purchased in Tennessee, uh, fashioned on a similar colony that she saw in Indiana. She was a correspondent. She was a guest of such luminaries as the Marquis Lafayette and Thomas Jefferson. Um, and she was the first woman to edit a journal, the Harmony Gazette, and the first woman to hold a series of lectures um, before both men and women. Women were not allowed to make public address. That was absolutely forbidden. Some aspects of Wright's community were very controversial. She, um, she promoted free love. She said that the institution of marriage was a discriminatory <coughs> institution. She established her own dress code for women that included pantalettes or pantaloons and a shorter skirt. And in her book, she wrote, How no however novel it might appear, I shall venture the assertion that until, until women assume the place in which society, which society, good sense and good feeling alike assign to them, human improvement must advance but feebly. It is in vain that we would circumscribe the power of one half of the race, and that half by far the most influential and important. In 1840, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott met at an international slavery convention in London. They had both been sent as delegates to this convention, and they were outraged when the men of the convention prevented them from addressing the convention. And not only that, they were actually put into this area behind a curtain, cordoned off so that they could see the proceedings, but would not be viewed or seen. This experience galvanized these two ladies into taking further action concerning women's rights. In 1848, the first women's rights convention in the United States was held in Seneca Falls, New York. Just imagine, this photo is from 1848. Photography only really started um, in about the 1830s. So, It was organized by Stanton, Mott, and several other women. And many of the participants signed a declaration of sentiments that outlined the main issues and goals for the emerging women's movement. And I have that. And I just want to read a couple of things from it. 
talking about what men have um, established of the tyranny that they've established, because that's actually where this, that, that quote came from was the uh, tyranny. Uh, he has not ever permitted her to exercise her inalienable right to the elective franchise. He has compelled her to submit to laws in the formation of which she had no voice. He has withheld from her rights which are given to the most ignorant and degraded men, both natives and foreigners. He has taken from her all right and property, even to the wages she earns. So that was a declaration of sentiments signed by these women. This convention in 1848 marked the beginning of regularly held meetings and conventions. And again, that's something that we take for granted today, but women organizing themselves, meeting independent of men, making their own schedules, their own events, this was unheard of at the time. Absolutely unheard of. It was a new concept. And to compare, this book, which I actually have a copy of, um, was published the same year in 1848. And it focuses on the proper behavior of women. It's a little advice book. Because up until that time, a woman really only had her looks, her behavior, and her reputation on which to rely and to get her through the world and through life. For example, according to this little book, a lady's behavior in the street should be modest, dignified, pleasant, and engaging. Never stare, never giggle, never walk with a wriggle or swing from side to side. <clears throat> Ladies are not allowed upon any um, uh, normal occasion to accept the arm of anyone but either a male relative or an accepted male suitor. A, a question beyond the most basic or necessary questions presented to her by a male in the street should be considered a gross insult and repelled with proper spirit. No pickup lines, thank you. <laughs> the Civil War disrupted many suffragist activities as women turned their energies to war work, serving as nurses and fundraisers, spies, and even a few. Uh, as uh, Robert Shirtleff in the Revolutionary War, a few women also in, uh, engaged directly in battle by enlisting um, under the guise of being men. They also served as spies in some, place, in some instances. They also were um, tasked with taking on the running of households and farms while their husbands were away for months or years. This war work provided training ground, though, for women. Um, to develop organizational and occupational skills. A great example of this, Clara Barton used what she w learned during the war to establish the Red Cross in America. Many more women would later use the, kn the knowledge that they gained um, in these suffrage and continuing on the suffrage activities. In 1870, the 15th Amendment gave the right to vote to the black male population. Disagreement over this amendment caused a split in the two, uh, on the organization or within the or Equal Rights uh, Organization, which had been formed in 1866, just four years earlier. The organization had, this organization had been dedicated to universal suffrage. So they didn't get everything that they wanted. Stanton and Anthony formed the National Women's Suffrage Association. While Anthony had been a lifelong advocate of both um, uh, abolition and women's rights, at this time she began to focus more on suffrage. Uh, it's said that they didn't always agree, there was certainly some fire between them, but that they made a good team. That Stanton was a good writer and um, Anthony a good um, speaker. So that was one organization. Lucy Stone from Massachusetts, along with others, organized the Boston-based American Women's, Women's Suffrage Association. She attended Oberlin. She was the first woman in Massachusetts to earn a college degree. And she was asked to write the commencement speech. However, she refused because if she wrote it, 
it would still have to be delivered by a male student or professor. <laughs> and as a matter of fact, I think it was 50 years later, she was invited back to deliver the commencement speech. In 1850, Stone was a leader in organizing the first National Women's Rights Convention in Worcester, Massachusetts. Now, the 1848 had been kind of a local meeting. This next one was a national one, drawing in women from many different states. She's remembered uh, most for uh, or one particular thing. She was the first woman to keep her own name after marriage. And she was, uh, that was not easy. Uh, for example, she went to uh, run to be on the school board and they wouldn't allow her to be a candidate for the school board unless she had her husband's name. So while we're talking about Massachusetts women, um, the woman on the left, Victoria Claflin Woodhull, of the Claflin family, the um, Wenham Museum right up the street here. Um, that's the Claflin, uh, Claflin House uh, that's, a, that's associated with the museum. So this is Victoria Claflin Woodhull on the left. She, was, um, she had a very colorful life. She promoted free love. Uh, she was the founder of the first women's stock brokerage. Uh, she was a spiritualist. She was pretty far out there. Um, and she ran, or ostensibly ran, in 1872 for president. Um, she didn't w run a full campaign, and actually I think uh, she didn't meet the minimum age requirement. Uh, and I think by the time the actual election came along, uh, she was in jail for something else. But she did, <laughs> she did kind of run. Um, the woman on the right, Belva Lockwood, did run for president in 1884 and again in 1888. Um, she, uh, she ran a very strong campaign and, and she actually got votes. Um, and I wanted to show you, but she didn't certainly get the respect. Oh, she was also the woman, first woman to be admitted to the Supreme Court bar. Uh, this, these, these were the men coming out to rally for Belva. They were called the Mother Hubbard group <laughs> and they would wear um, they would have little Belva Lockwood signs and they wore like nightgowns and bonnets to basically make fun of her for running. In 1874, the Women's Christian Temperance Union formed and in addition to becoming a powerful voice against the evils of liquor, this organization was also an important force in the fight for suffrage. Not surprisingly, the liquor industry opposed women's suffrage because they were afraid that the moment women got the vote that they would vote liquor, uh, uh, vote liquor out of being legal. So there were all these organizations in the later part of the 1800s forming uh, and beginning to have meetings and um, marches and um, such trying to move the women's agenda and suffrage forward. And I just want to take a moment uh, to, as part of that, a lot of them developed you know, speeches and campaign slogans and such, and also suffrage songs. And I happen to have a suffrage song here, so I thought I'd like to share it with you. I have a neighbor, one of those not very hard to find, who know it all without debate and never change their mind. I asked him what of woman's rights, he said in tones severe, my mind on that is all made up, keep woman in her sphere. I saw a man in tattered garb forth from the grog shop come. He squandered all his cash for drink and starved his wife at home. I asked him should not woman vote, he answered with a sneer. I've taught my wife to know her place, keep woman in her sphere. I met an earnest, thoughtful man not many days ago. 
who ponder deep all human law, the honest truth to know. I asked him what of woman's cause, the answer came sincere. Her rights are just the same as mine, let woman choose her sphere. <laughs> That and any number of other songs were used through the marches and protests and campaigns and such. So in 1878, a woman's suffrage amendment was introduced to the United States Congress, but it did not pass. It is interesting to note, though, that throughout the individual states, um, suffrage legislation took place far earlier. So let's take a look at the map. The olive states down here, um, women had no voting rights whatsoever. In the orange states, women could vote in the presidential elections. Uh, that, those are the light orange states. In the dark orange states, women could vote in the primaries only. And in the blue states, women um, had full voting rights. So you notice that the blue states are mostly out west, and that's probably for a couple of reasons. Um, because in the harsh frontier, women were, had a very important and central role in the success of settling the frontier, and also quite possibly because it would serve as a, um, an incentive for women to want to move out west um, if they could enjoy complete suffrage out there. However, despite the state-by-state uh, circumstances, suffragists felt that there was nothing short of a con constitutional amendment uh, would suffice. In 1890, the organization that had split into two um, after uh, the black men got the vote in 1870, that organization had split into two, it came back together um, under the leadership of Elizabeth Cady Stanton. But Elizabeth Cady Stanton uh, was pretty radical and after only two years um, she withdrew. That's an interesting point just all across the board which is we just we tend to think of things well kinda like our political parties nowadays we tend to think of things as being very you know one color uh, but within the suffragists there were people who uh, were much like Belva Lockwood. Belva Lockwood actually uh, be in the early days, she was respected, but she became kind of shunned by some of the other suffragists because they thought she was going too far in trying to actually run for president. And they just thought it was going to open up the um, suffragist movement for, to ridicule for her to run. Now, you might think that every woman would have been in favor of getting the vote. But that wasn't true. In 1911, the National Association Opposed to Women Suffrage was organized by a group of wealthy uh, women um, and were joined by Catholic clergymen and uh, many heads of large uh, manufacturing and other large companies, uh, including the liquor industry, of course. Um, and locally, the February 6th, 1912 edition of the Salem Evening News declared, Wenham women oppose suffrage. So if any of you women are from Wenham. <laughs> <laughs> so here's a poster of what would happen to a woman's home should she be granted the right to vote. Socks have holes in them. You know, lamp has gone out, no more lamp oil. Husband looks kind of, you know, like a mess. Uh, this is what will happen if women are out <laughs> voting. Um, there were a lot of reasons given for um, being against women getting the vote, and here are a few of them. No woman who may vote will attend to her domestic duties, uh, as we just saw. It will make dissension between husband and wife. And then, Counter to that, men and women are so much alike that men can represent a woman's views. <laughs> women will vote as her husband tells her to. Women will form a solid party and outvote men, which is probably what they were really worried about. <laughs> but this is my favorite. Whoops, what happened? Some guys doing something. 
<laughs> Women have no powers of organization. <laughs> Despite this, in 1912, um, Theodore Roosevelt's Progressive Party um, was the, became the first national political party to adopt a woman's suffrage plank um, in his bid for the presidency. Finally, suffrages, suffrages, the suffrage movement was making some really strong and established headway. It was no longer just a fringe kind of thing. However, Woodrow Wilson became the next president, and he was anti-suffrage. During the early teens, the National Women's Party organized hunger strikes and picketing. Um, at first, Wilson was tolerant, but eventually he lost patience and he ordered the protesters jailed, where they received much publicized poor treatment, beatings and forced feedings and such. It became an embarrassment to the White House and eventually all the protesters were released. The United States entered World War I in 1917 and almost immediately the Wilson administration called on women to support the war effort. All over the country, women massed behind the war effort in m multiple ways. Uh, they joined drives to sell liberty bonds and war savings stamps. They went to club meetings, they stood on street corners, anywhere just to raise money to help the war effort. Others helped the Red Cross uh, provide medical supplies, and yet others worked at government agencies and, um, and other wartime women's associations that formed to support the war effort. Thousands of female volunteers had the chance for the first time uh, to wear Red Cross and other uniforms that marked them as people of influence and particular skill. Thousands more had the unprecedented opportunity to serve in the military as for the first time certain areas of the military were open to women. During the fall of 1917, the United States Employment Service recognized that thousands of women would have to work in the war industries. Women came out of their jobs to uh, came out of their homes to do the jobs that had been vacated by men. And by the winter of 1917-1918, it was clear that women were going to have to take on jobs that were men's work. Uh, above uh, the the photo here is of women at a uh, in a welding uh, manufacturing. Now, of course, in view of the suffragists. The fact that women were being called upon to support the war effort in such really critical ways was just further fuel to the idea that they were equal, an equal and an integral part of society and deserved to be treated as such. The National American uh, Asso Suffrage Association, uh, under the direction of Carrie Chapman Catt, formed a plan to coordinate nationwide suffrage lobbying using men's tactics of meetings and lobbying somebody who was in favor to get them to convince their constituents to vote in favor of it too. In 1918, Wilson came around to their way of thinking and actually he encouraged um, the House and Senate to pass the amendment saying that it was an act of right and justice to the women of the country and of the world. But it continued to pass, it, it failed to pass again. Finally, in 1919, it did pass, uh, but it needed to be ratified by 36 states. 35 states ratified it, and then all eyes turned to Tennessee. Now, as you might remember on the um, map that we looked at earlier, Tennessee was one of those states where women had no rights, no voting rights at all. Um, and it, the vote looked to be extremely tight. It was a really close race and it became known as the War of the Ro Roses. Uh, those in favor of suffra suffrage wore yellow roses, those opposed to suffrage wore red roses as they went into Senate chambers and such. The swing vote was in question, and it was held by Harry Byrne. 
a young representative, and when I say young, he was about 24 years old. His earlier actions and statements uh, had conflicted. It didn't, wasn't really clear that he stood on one side or the other, and it seemed likely that he would probably vote against and go along with his party. And he might have done just that if it hadn't been for a letter from his mother. <laughs> Feb Byrne was an independ independent-minded widow running a farm um, in Tennessee, but she found time to follow along with all the newspaper reports of the day uh, and keep up on the, the, the news. And she was watching what was happening with this movement. And so she wrote a letter and she said she had um, heard the recent, she had seen the recent news about the uh, uncertainty of the outcome of the vote. And she finally felt compelled to write this letter to her son. And she wrote, Hurrah and vote for suffrage and don't keep them in doubt. I noticed Chandler's speech, it was very bitter. I've been waiting to see how you stood but have not seen anything yet. Don't forget to be a good boy and help Mrs. Cat with her rats. Is she the one that put rat in ratification? Ha! No more from Mama this time, with lots of love, Mama. And so Tennessee became the 36th state to ratify. Women had finally won the right to vote. Now, I, I've gotten this question several times, so finally I've incorporated a little bit um, into it, and that is a lot of people ask me, so how does this compare to the rest of the world? And obviously this could be a conversation unto itself. We can spend another whole hour talking about women's rights and suffrage and such throughout the world. But just a, a broad brush. Um, in the 18th century, Swedish and Polish women um, who paid taxes were allowed voting rights, although Sweden later rescinded those rights. In the 19th century, Finnish taxpaying women were granted municipal local voting rights. And um, in 1906, they were actually the first women uh, country to vote in universal suffrage. Late in the 19th century, the women in the UK were granted local voting rights, but they didn't actually win full suffrage until after us in 1928. Many countries came in ahead of the U United States, Poland, Denmark, Austria, Belgium, and New Zealand. And others followed us, um, South Africa, France. Uh, South Africa was in 1930, France was in 1945, and Greece was in 1952. And even into the 21st century, um, Oman and Kuwait and others are continuing. So this is a, this is a continuing uh, saga. So now let's switch gears completely and talk about fashion. <laughs> and its role as an indicator of the transformation. Between 1900 and the mid-twenties, the feminine ideal, feminine ideal in America underwent a complete metamorphosis. At the turn of the century, the Gibson girl defined the age. The phrase was made popular um, by the illustrations of Charles Dana Gibson. The Gibson girl was defined by long, swept-up hair, uh, a narrow waist, well-concealed legs, a high brow. Um, and the Gibson girl was not capable of any immodest thought or deed. She was pleasant and intelligent and well-spoken, but would certainly not have gotten involved in politics or this like. She was aloof and kind of matronly. By the 1920s, the Gibson girl had vanished. <laughs> And in her place was the flapper, uh, so named perhaps because she was kind of like a fledgling that wasn't quite ready to flap out of the nest yet. Uh, quite unlike the Gibson girl, the flapper cut off her hair, concealed her forehead, de-emphasized her curves, and showed as much leg as possible. She also wore plenty of makeup, which up until that point in time had really only been employed by loose women. During the first half of the 20s, skirt length became the boiling point of the social revolution. Right after um, World War II, uh, or since 1915, skirts had been kind of drifting up and drifting up. Um, after World War I, um, skirts had gone to six to seven inches up. 
Uh, by 1920, all restraint had been thrown away and they were up another five to six inches. And the shorter skirt was not the only major fashion statement. Clothing was also you know, lighter, there was less of it. Um, corsets and chemises and all that kind of stuff gave way. And in 1928, um, the Journal of Commerce declared that a woman's outfit in 1913 uh, required 19 and a half yards of fabric. And by 1928, it required seven and a half yards of fabric. <laughs> The 1920s also uh, witnessed an explosion of beauty shops, going from 5,000 in 1920 to 40,000 um, in 1930. Sales of cosmetics at that same period jumped 400%. In 1921, the first Miss America pageant was, uh, was staged in Atlantic City. While women's Expanding political opportunities contributed to the sense of the new woman. Changes in work were also equally important. World War I brought short-term uh, opportunities for a variety of jobs as women filled in for those men that were absent away and uh, fighting in the war. And in addition, new business technologies such as stenography and typing and such um, opened up all kinds of new white-collar jobs. The women flocked to these white collar jobs because they had more status and they were better paying than the blue collar jobs that they had been filling in for such as you know in factories stitching and such. More than 88,000 people, women, were employed as telephone operators and by 1917 um, women accounted for 99 percent of all switchboard operators. At the turn of the century, young working women had most often lived in, in, at home, or if their work was too far away to allow for that, then they would, live, they would board somewhere locally. In the 1920s, between school and marriage, women were um, sharing apartments with other young women and, um, and working. Uh, having their own apartments gave women this new sense of autonomy and adulthood, of freedom. It gave their parents a lot of worry, for good reason. <laughs> Jazz was all the rage. And the newspaper in the New York American uh, reported its results on the national character, declaring, moral disaster is coming to th hundreds of young women, American girls, through the pathological, nerve-irritating, sex-exciting music of jazz musicians. <laughs> in just two years, in Chicago alone, according to the Illinois Vigilance Association, they could track the downfall of a thousand girls directly to the pernicious influence of jazz. <laughs> A social worker reported on the unwholesome excitement encountered even in small town dances. Boy and girl couples left in a state of dangerous disturbance. <laughs> Bathtub gin, jumpy jazz music, suggestive couples dancing, and short skirts all led to a new era of relaxed sexual norms. Rudolph Valentino made millions of women swoon, branded shake condoms, pictured here, held all the promise of romantic Valentino-esque liaisons. <laughs> One father described his experience thus, I was sure that my girls had never experimented with hip pocket flasks or flirted with other women's husbands or smoked cigarettes. And my, mom, my, my wife, well, she entertained the same smug idea. She was saying something like that at the dinner table the other night when my daughter Elizabeth uh, was listening and my wife began to talk about a woman that my daughter Elizabeth knew and she said, well, I've heard that that Purvis girl has cigarette parties at her house. Elizabeth was 
examining her mother with a curious eye. She made no reply, but then she said, turned to me and said, Dad, let me see your cigarettes. Without the slightest suspicion of what was forthcoming, I threw Elizabeth my cigarettes. She withdrew one from the package, tapped it on her wrist, inserted it between her lips, reached over and took my lighted cigarette and lit her own, and blew airy smoke rings. My wife nearly fell out of her chair. And I might have fallen out of mine had I been not momentarily too stunned. Young working women often modeled their behavior and their dreams on the movies. In the 1920s, movie stars replaced political, business, and artistic figures as those to emulate, um, as role models for young women. Ironically, the movies, in turn, turned to the lives of young women for inspiration for their storylines, especially as young women made up a large portion of their movie audience. Films showed office workers and department store clerks uh, working alongside wealthy bosses. The idea was that if you were smart and perky and enough and that you would land the boss and, and become wealthy. In 1928, 39% of college graduates were women, which was up from 19% at the turn of the century. That same year, women began to compete in track and field events at the Olympics. Women had not been allowed to compete. There were no women's events at the first Olympics in 1896. The opinion being that their competition would be impractical, uninteresting, unesthetic, and incorrect. They began competing in 1900 in lawn tennis and golf. In 1912, women's swimming was uh, added, but American women did not compete in that first swimming competition because American women were required for all sporting events to wear skirts. And it is very hard to wear a skirt and swim. <laughs> so throughout the um, Roaring 20s, women were enjoying new freedoms, work opportunities, and robust prosperity of the decade. Let's take just kind of a fun look at what that looked like. 
Of course, the giddiness of the 1920s couldn't last, and with the stock market crash and the subsequent depression into the 1930s, there was even some ground lost. Some women, uh, some states actually uh, outlawed women taking jobs uh, because they felt that they were taking them away from the men who were seeking work as well. At the same time, though, there were, there was gain, there were gains in other areas. Um, Frances Perkins uh, became the first uh, cabinet member as the Secretary of Labor. Um, Jane Addams became the first woman to win a Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, and Eleanor Roosevelt became uh, the first woman to be a UN delegate, and also she just changed the, the she changed the face of what first ladies would be like going forward. She also held a press conference um, to which only women reporters were invited. <laughs> then came World War II, and many more women signed up to go overseas, just as they had during World War I. Um, and they were once again proving that they were an integral part of the fabric of our nation. And so, we come back around to the foreshadowing words of Abigail Adams when she wrote, if particular care and attention is not paid to the ladies, we are determined to foment a rebellion and will not hold ourselves bound by any laws in which we have no voice or representation. How right she was. As we've seen in the incredible evolution that could never, I don't believe, ever have been envisioned by Abigail or perhaps even those first women at the uh, first convention in 1848. It was a long road, but through perseverance and by so many individuals over the decades, so many different organizations, women won the right to vote to work in a wide variety of careers and jobs, to wear what they want, to do what they want, and to enjoy a new level of independence that would carry them forth into this century and beyond as a powerful political, social, economic, and cultural force. Thank you.